the way today. So I would start with the first clinical scenario. Okay, so the first clinical scenario is a 64-year female patient is uh, presented to you with epigastric pain, nausea, uneasiness since this morning. She says uh, she still has ongoing discomfort and dyspepsia. She has taken antacids with nil relief. Uh, she's currently on metformin and glimepiride for diabetes mellitus. Her vital signs are pressures of 90 upon 58, pulse rate of 54 per minute, uh, respiratory rate of 22 per minute, and oxygen starts of 95% on air. How would you manage this case? Uh, Dr. Jones, uh, are participants allowed to interact? Uh, they can only type in the chat box, doctor. So maybe uh, I can tell you. You no want to. Uh, no worries, no worries. Then, then I'll talk accordingly. No worries. Okay. So uh, once you receive the 64-year female, uh, so the, the red flags in a sign are like a basic small history as well. You say that the patient has got an epigastric discomfort, which is ongoing. She feels dyspeptic, nauseous. Uh, she is diabetic. If you see the blood pressure, it's still a little on the lower end. If you see the heart rate, it's definitely going down. Something's going on. So what we usually do is randomly we would prescribe them a proton pump inhibitor, we would give them whatnot, basically. So yes, someone, Nikita has, uh, thank you, Nikita. Yeah, ECG, great, great, guys. That's what I'm saying. Any patients who are above 50 coming in with any sort of chest discomfort, especially if they're diabetic, it may not be a classical presentation of angina. Yes, so someone has written O2, yeah. So the first thing that you wanna do is A, B, C, D, E. Yeah, the patient is talking, airway is patent, great. What about the SATs? SATs look fine. The breathing rate also looks okay. You come to the circulatory parameter, you see something's wrong with the circulation here. So in the circulation, as I said, uh, you're checking for the circulatory parameters, get an IV line, take bloods, uh, make sure that you also check uh, for the troponins, most specific are the troponins. If your institute uses any other form of cardiac enzymes, please go with it. Uh, start the patient on uh, some painkillers or something, give them symptomatic care and please arrange for an ECG. Because once you arrange for an ECG, you, know, you never know what's coming. So for this patient, for instance, this is the ECG. Can anyone tell me what's happening with the ECG? All right, let's move on. So as you can see, leads two, three and AVF are showing some changes along with the reciprocal changes from V2 to V5. So this patient, or oh, you can't see the ECG. Okay, just a second. I think it's available now. So uh, this patient is actually having uh, ACS, and if we go into the depth of it, this patient is having uh, ST elevated MI. And now, if you see, it's an inferior wall since 2, 3, and AVF are involved. So, what's happening with this patient? Though she presented with a chest discomfort, she did not say of any chest pain, obvious palpitations, shortness of breath, dizziness, or you know, the typical signs that we usually see. So now the patient has got an inferior wall MI. What do you do? How do you treat this patient? So you follow the ACLS algorithm. So the reason uh, ACLS algorithms work well is because it's standardized, standardized for you, standardized for the nurses, the paramedics, you know, it comes as a team. Basically, you can't do anything alone in the ED. So what do you do? Once you've made sure, oh, the patient's got an MI, what do you, the first thing you want to give the patient is an aspirin. Uh, usually we do get 325 milligrams. At times we'll get 300 milligrams. The main concept still remains the same. Try giving 325 milligrams, if not 300 milligrams of aspirin immediately. Start the patient on oxygen. Like in the medical school, we all have read of Mona, isn't it? So uh, the reason I'm not saying Mona now is because morphine and the nitroglycerin uh, should are relatively contraindicated in inferior wall MI. So start the patient on oxygen, get a IV line in place, get the troponins, get some painkillers. And meanwhile, keep checking the vital signs, go for your other physical signs.
team uh, don't just rush giving stuff you know uh, the cardiology team would take care of this patient because this patient would eventually benefit not from aspirin or the oxygen it may decrease the mortality but uh, the patient is going to benefit from either a uh, primary intervention or a thrombolysis so what happens is like uh, if for instance i'm going to tell if someone is sitting in a peripheral setup okay they're sitting 20 kilometers away from the city the patient comes with this you got a ecg machine great you've done the ecg you think okay the patient is having a mi so transportation of the patient is equally important unfortunately there is not a very very good transporting system in our country so whenever you transporting the patient try getting a iv line in place the reason being these patients are quite susceptible to have a ventricular arrhythmias and if we don't have iv line in place and they crash you know the prognosis becomes quite bad okay so uh, let's talk a brief brief about various ec changes that you can see on a patient they can be st elevated mis which can be the elevations you can have the non st elevated mis which can still be normal so even if for instance this patient would have presented but the ecg would not have shown any specific changes any chest discomfort any abdominal discomfort over 15 minutes of time should be treated as acs unless proven otherwise so for instance now we go with the first one that a patient had a stemi uh, we start all the adjuvant therapies and the goal should be to you know minimize the delay in reperfusion reperfusion can be of two basic ways the patient can go for a pci which should be done from door to the needle uh, within 90 minutes uh, and uh, the other way is to give fibrinolysis therapy which should be done within 30 minutes of time but most of these would be in a tertiary care center as i said if you're not in a tertiary care center if you think uh, you know the nearest hospital is 50 kilometers from the lane you must thrombolyze the patient that's what you know is going to save the life of the patient is going to save his myocardium otherwise they may die they may still die so uh, it depends basically on every institution but the ideal guideline still says that if you you have the tertiary care facility you have the pci facility it's a gold standard if you don't just thrombolyze the patient uh, the other uh, ecg changes that you could see in a patient either it's unstable angina or non stemi for these uh, troponin comes into play so troponin plays a very very vital role uh, usually for instance if a, a patient started to have a chest pain at 6 am the patient presents to you at 7 730 and you take first set of the troponin and still it is in the normal range don't go blindly with it always repeat a uh, 3 hr serial troponin get serial ecgs on the patient to see if they they are developing any dynamic stt changes uh adjuvant therapy is indicated in non stemi basically so if we uh, talk about it so the patient may be getting non stemi may be given heparin may be given nitroglycerin beta blockers what not basically but the main thing is you must not treat them independently okay uh always involve the cardiologist so uh, if the patient is still suspect suspicious of a lower intermediate acs you know or develop any dynamic ecg changes keep the patient then don't send them randomly home uh, we all might would have seen some patients who came to you as a chest pain and ended up coming to the hospital again being more sick being more critical because we missed it so uh, be a little safe on your part even you know uh, if you've done everything make sure you've documented it we are very very poor in documenting so what could be the other causes of chest pain come on guys i'm just gonna randomly get some answers here because i think i'm running a little short on time okay so what are the basic causes of differential diagnosis of chest pain if we talk okay am i great because it's obviously the most common what are the other most common reasons so if your patient is involved in any sort of accident yeah okay i'm getting replies costochondritis god great okay flail chest great that's what i'm saying if the patient is involved in trauma think about having a rib fracture think about having a hemoneumohydrothorax uh, think about having a pneumothorax tension pneumothorax great aortic dissection as well yes so how, how do you basically differentiate uh, a very very quick clinical examination how do you differentiate whether the patient has got aortic dissection or not what would you do which would re, uh, raise a suspicion for you to have a aortic dissection or a triple a basically a uh, aortic aneurysm okay so what we usually do in common practice is always check for the radio radial delay 
okay and also check for the radio femoral delay this gives us a basic idea if there is a pulse pressure difference basically between the both arms arms and legs that may be an indication that your patient may be having a aortic dissection may be having a triple a yeah yeah great radio radial delay so always you know make it a common practice when you're touching the patient on the right always touch them on the left if if you and you know if if you're suspecting any chest pain always check for the radio radial radio femoral delays okay the other common reasons as yes god can be a very very common reason and acid reflux can be a very very uh, common reason uh, asthmatic patients can also present with chest pain patient with metastatic diseases tubercle losses what not basically uh, okay uh, i'll give a quick quick check now uh, who's listening as a lecture so your patient comes uh, with a blunt trauma of the chest he was driving a car wasn't wearing a seat belt uh, like got his chest injured upper part with the steering wheel and now he's coming in with the chest pain when you examine you can see that his jvp is quite full his pulse pressures is low his bp is low what would you suspecting in this patient anyone okay blunt chest trauma okay with a uh, hemodynamic instability low pulse pressure low bp and extensive jvp okay cardiac tamponade very good dr ajini so cardiac tamponade see guys uh, we usually don't see it in everyday practice but this should be in our mind okay if the patient any point of time had a cardiac procedure recently uh, they may have a pericardial effusion which may turn into a tamponade if they present with the blunt chest trauma they may present with a tamponade the best way is always check for the neck while you examining the patient if you have a excessively full jvp very very you know sort of muffled heart sound not always heard but low intensity heart sound patient is in hemodynamic instability hemodynamic shock think of aortic uh, uh, sorry cardiac